16,000 for my brand new car, 13,000 for a piece of sod, 80,000 to begin a home, a dollar I gave to God. A tidy sum to entertain my friends in pointless chatter. And, the wor and when the world goes crazy mad, I ask, Lord, what's the matter? Yet there is one big question for the answer I still search. With things so bad in this old world, what's holding back my church? So let's uh, keep that in our thoughts and our prayers as we listen to the prelude.
prayer. Dear God, we come before you humbled by the magnificence of your world, because even though we're fighting with a COVID disease and maybe someone has some ills and some anxious times within them this morning, maybe they didn't want to talk about it yet, we know that you are in this world with us. We have that reassurance. And we want to thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again in three days. We also want to offer praise up to those that have been traveling, such as the Millers, who had a chance to see some parts of the world that we may not have seen for a while, and uh, brought them back to us safely. And we thank you so much for that. We, have, we are offering prayers for Charlene, who is awaiting test results, for Brian Smith, who is slowly being healed from COVID. We also want to offer up Nathan as he prepares to probably get surgery on his gallbladder. We also want to thank you for helping to guide the parents and the grandparents and the great-grandparents and the medical staff for L. We all know that when it's such a young little, little life, it's so hard on us to even understand why they have to go, why they are going through such things. But we continue to pray for her and for the medical staff that they are able to figure out what it is they need to do next to, to offer her the best chance for total recovery. We want to also Pray for Paul. He's had a rough time of it this last week or so. Uh, again, it's hard on the family, so we ask that you lift them up. We also ask that you lift up the medical staff for Paul. You know, Lord, I always pray for the medical staff because I know that you gave my medical staff the right things to do. And so I, we continue to, to pray for them in addition to the patients. We. There are many things going on in this world, Lord, that we don't agree with, or we do agree with, and we just don't know how to think of some things. But we simply allow you to take our worry and our concerns and turn them into uplifting praise for you. We ask that you lead and guide the sermon today and Pastor John as he delivers it. Also, all the Sunday school teachers, as they go to their classes, lead and guide us in the week to come on the challenges we're going to be faced with, and we know we're going to have challenges, but we ask that you reinforce our belief, our uplifting of us, so that we can use our belief in you to answer the world on what we say and do. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I just thought I'd start out by reading something from Franklin D. Roosevelt that he wrote on, or he read on, he said on June 4th, 1944, but if you listen to the, what he said, it kind of per, could pertain to today. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true, give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. Their road will be long and hard, for the enemy is strong. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again, and we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial uh, arrogancies. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will, lead, that will let all of men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil.
are in those deep waters and we have to keep our eyes above the waves. It's an appropriate song. Um, just a couple things to... Uh... If you place Christ first in your life, you will have the rest of your priorities in proper order and view them in the right perspective. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Do not be afraid, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Genesis 15.1 Though we can feel invisible to others at times, we are always visible to God. And just because you don't see a way doesn't mean God doesn't have a way. In my wrestling and in my doubts in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. to show
feel what tomorrow brings With each morning I'll rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, You are my love so blessed that each day you come to us with the gift of your spirit to help us and strengthen our purpose for your glory. Continue to work in us, O Lord, and help us grow to be the people you wish us to be. Thank you for your continued goodness even when we stumble. Thank you that you are ever present to hold our hands and lift us up. Your unconditional love has been promised forever. Thank you for your gracious mercy to us each day. Amen. I'm going to read the scripture reading today. It's Philippians 4, 10 to 13. And uh, of course, very familiar with for, for many of us, especially the last verse. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being con content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything, everything through him who gives me strength. What does it mean to be content? Content. Uh, that's out of my vocabulary. Ooh, what does it mean to be content? Contentment. I don't know. Just to be satisfied. I guess being satisfied with something. Find, a, I guess, an inner peace with yourself, being uh, happy with who you are. Not let your wants outweigh what you have. I guess it means to be happy, not really want anything else, I guess. Uh, I guess it means um, all right with what, how you are. Being okay with what's going on. Not necessarily being uh, entirely happy about it, like having a positive sense, but also not having a negative sense. You're not worried about um, what other people think about you. Contentment is having the Lord on your side. Are you a content person? Am I content? No, I don't think I'm content. No, I'm not content. No, I don't think I'm very content. <laughs> I don't think I'm very content, actually. Some days, you know, I'm happier than others. Are you content with your life? Not at the moment. Mm, sometimes. I would consider myself a very content person. I'd say I am, yeah. I think I could be a better person sometimes. Is there anything that could happen to make you more content with your life? There's always things that can make you more content with your life. Probably just more money right now. Finding a 
I guess this perfect soulmate and all those, you know, stereotypical things. Get a good job, provide for my daughter and myself without having to rely on everybody else. What is your source of contentment? Uh, just feeling complete in myself. Try to keep a positive outlook. That makes me content. That having my bills paid makes it a lot easier to be content. Some material possession self. What's the source of your contentment? I suppose my mother. Just following my emotions, sort of a transcendentalist, romanticist. Why do you think most people are not content with their lives? I have no clue. I don't know, there's just something missing, I guess. Honestly, I mean, I think that they're searching. We live in a materialistic society, and everybody thinks that when they get the bigger car, or the bigger house, or the nicer pool, they're going to be happy. Everybody's reaching for something. Got to have money, got to have looks, got to have all these things. People want more, their, more money, better cars, bigger houses. People don't really have a purpose, like a reason to get up in the morning. They don't have Jesus. They are, uh searching for something to fill that, that void, and uh, they're not going to find it. I think a lot of people need um, Jesus just for the fulfillment in their lives. They try to fill their lives with so many so many things that just don't fill the void. Could be music, could be drugs, could be anything. And uh, there's no otherworldly peace that they can have. You're never going to have that satisfaction, that fulfillment, unless you have him. He is um, a lot of the con contentment that people are looking for. Now, how many of you, when you think about it, growing up, really enjoyed winter? How many of you, when you were a child, you grow, I mean, some of you may not enjoy winter now, but uh, when you were a child, you, yeah, you really grew, you enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed it. I mean, we would get drifted in, and the excitement of watching the two big John Deere tractors tethered together, uh, come over the hill, and. Uh, with a big V plow in front of the one in the uh, of the tractor and just slicing through three to four foot uh, drifts and fly, snow flying off into the bank. We had two ponds and they would freeze over sometimes before Christmas and all I can just remember the ice hockey games that we played uh, day after day sled riding down the deep pasture hills and I think every one of my brothers and myself have a scar on our chins because of trees that would jump right into our sledding path. But then, you know, late February comes and March. The weather would be cold, damp, and dreary. The snow would become sloppy and dirty. Ice on the ponds would become too soft. And there really just wasn't much to do outside. Oh, yes, we had chores to do, like feeding the chickens, caring for our German shepherds that we raised. But day after day, you waited. I want that first sign of spring to come. Things will change then. We can be outside. We can enjoy the day again. And then, the first signs of spring. Things are changing. The sun is out longer. Days are longer. The daffodils start to break through the ground and slowly come to a place of blossoming. Welcome, spring. <clears throat> How many of you have felt like that in recent years? Paul's experience could be depicted kind of in the same way. Paul was in prison long days and nights as he slowly was uh, being transported from one place to another to get him to Rome. And how he wanted to know uh, how the church in the city of Philippi was doing and were they had they forgotten about him, he had planted the church there. And then quite unexpectedly, Spring arrived in him, for him. 
Epaphroditus showed up with a significant financial gift from the church in Philippi, Philippi to support Paul. And look at the passage. When Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that you at length, now at length, you have revived your concern for me. And that word revive could be translated into bloom. It is like Paul was saying, you've caused your thinking on my behalf to bloom anew, spring as a risen. You brought joy to my heart by your kindness that you showed in your generosity. You are like the first bloom of the daffodil after a cold, long, dark winter. It's interesting though, after expressing his thanksgiving and his sense of joy over their generosity, Paul immediately makes this shift to explain kind of the, the lesson, what he was learning during that period of long, cold, dark winter. And he says, what I've learned is I've learned contentment. Whatever situation, he says, the circumstance in which I am placed in at any moment. Sometimes I had money. Sometimes I was flat broke. Sometimes I had adequate food. Sometimes I was hungry. But I've learned, and it wasn't an easy learning process. The word that he talks about or that he uses there to describe learning speaks of it as being a, a, a difficult process of learning. I find it very interesting that the word that Paul uses to, des uh, to describe contentment is an interesting word because it literally means to be sufficient within yourself. Now, I'm not talking about, when you, you, he uses that word, he's not talking about the self-sufficiency I, I referred to a couple of weeks ago when I talked about the feet washing uh, service that, ah, oh, I just don't need anybody, I can handle it on my own. No, for him, it means that he was sufficient within himself. He didn't need his outside circumstances to make him happy, to make him feel satisfied. It, it, his, his inner sense of contentment, his inner sense of satisfaction, his inner sense of, of peace in, the, in his situation came from within, but it didn't come because he was self-sufficient. It was because Christ was in him. And that's why you get verse 13. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. It was Jesus Christ present within me through the Holy Spirit that enabled me to experience a sense of peace. So when you think about contentment, it's kind of an emotional state of having me accepted one's situation. It's not a resignation to it. It isn't like, you remember that old song? Some of us older people will remember it. If it weren't for bad luck. I had no, yeah. So it's not that kind of contentment. Isn't that kind of attitude of just um, like, ah, that's just the way life is. I can't do anything about it. And you kind of resign yourself uh, to it. No, it's a state of peacefulness despite life's tough circumstances. In a sense, contentment is the absence of worry. Whether that be about who you are, what you have or don't have, or what your condition in life is. The scriptures put great value on contentment. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2, uh, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And if you look at the New Living Translation, it says, yet true godliness. And, and Paul is setting up a contrast between those who are preaching the gospel because they just want to get rich and they're, really their life is about money. And he says that no, what is true wealth. He says, yet true, yet true godliness with contentment, that is where great wealth is. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, 
Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And the New Living Translation puts it this way. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Contentment uh, comes from recognizing I have what I need within myself independent of circumstances because I have Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is a freedom from worry, a sense of satisfaction with life. It is a means, uh, 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 it means that there, there's a, a level of detachment, meaning that uh, I'm okay if I don't get what I want. But it isn't being fatalistic or passive. Socrates once was asked, uh, who is the wealthiest? And he replied, he that is content with the least. Now, contentment is really a hard thing to learn. And it's actually something that gets repeated in the process of life. When we were first married, um, I pastored a church part-time while I was in seminary. In the early 80s to mid 80s. And then I went full-time with that church as the couple years passed after I graduated seminary. And basically at that time, uh, we were having children. We had three. And uh, we were living off of my part-time salary alone with the, with the church. And so one year annual conference was going to be held in Phoenix, Arizona. And so we scrimped and scra scraped and saved money so because we wanted to go to annual conference as a family and then take vacation, go up and see the Grand Canyon and then go to the West Coast to see the Pacific Ocean. So our our plan was to rent a car after conference and go up to the Grand Canyon and out to the West Coast. But you know, you can't rent a car without what? A credit card. Credit card. So I had no credit card. So I applied for one and um, I never got, got it. Never heard anything, period. So I assumed that I had not been approved. Ironically, I found out years later that I had. Um, my bank at that time had run a credit check on me and I remember the lady saying to me, well, you have a credit card that you've never used. I'm like, really? I don't know that I have a credit card. Where's that at? <laughs> and I turned out to find out that I had been approved, but the bank never issued the card. But we were up against it. It was time to go to annual conference. I had no idea, once we got out there, how I was going to get the car. And whether we were going to end up just being stuck in Phoenix for the next week and a half as we planned our vacation because I couldn't get a car. It's interesting how... God works, and he wants us to learn to rely on him and not get characterized or be filled with anxiety. So what happened was we, we had the cash for our vacation, and I took it with me, and at annual conference, one of my friends uh, from the church I grew up in, I don't even know how he found out, uh, but he offered uh, to put the car on his business credit card. Some of you might think that's um, a little questionable, but at that time I was desperate and said, okay. But he said, I had to take, I had to pay for the car in full when I kept, turned it back in so it would come off his credit card, which I agreed we had the money to do. So there we were, we were set to go. And we had the car and we began uh, our trip. 
And about midway through our vacation, I received a phone call. Somebody in the church had passed away and the family really wanted us to come back and do the funeral. What it meant was that we had to cut our vacation short by one day. And so um, I agreed to do that. I did the order wrong because I shouldn't have agreed because when I said I agreed to do it and then I called the airline to rebook our tickets to an earlier flight to find out that they were gonna charge us $75 a ticket to make that change. Well, that I had no money for. So on the phone, I booked the flights and she said, when you get to the airport, you just go to the ticket desk and, uh, and you, you can pay then for your flight. So I had no idea how we were gonna do that because I had the money set aside to cover the cost of the car, uh, but I was, didn't have money for an extra $300 for transferring the tickets. When we went back, I said to the, in the, the guy at the ticket desk, I said to him, uh, I need to change my flight. I called the airline, they, they got me booked, so can you get me tickets? for uh, this one, I'm a pastor, I have to go back for a funeral. We stood there, we stood there. He was working on his computer, we stood there. And finally he looked up at me, and I don't know what, how, what God was doing in his heart, but it's, he, he gave him a soft heart toward us. He looked at me and he said, you know, I'm not supposed to do what I'm about to do for you. And that is, I'm going to get you these tickets free of charge, and I'm going to give you the boarding passes tonight, because we got back the night before, because we flew out early. And this is what I want you to do. Tomorrow morning when you come back, I want you to just return your car and go directly to the gate. Here are your tickets and your boarding pass. And it cost us nothing. It was a reminder to me that sometimes the circumstances we find ourselves in are really beyond our control. They happen. And we can experience a lot of anxiety, a lot of frustration because of the change of circumstances that happen beyond our control. But the Lord wants us to learn something else during that period of time. That our lives do not need to be shaped by an overwhelming sense of fear, anxiety, life is out of control, but that he is Lord. And he's Lord of us. And he cares for us. God has had to repeatedly teach me that lesson over the years that there is a sufficiency within me, not within my own self and my own strength, but the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit who is present with me in all circumstances. And the same is true for years, for you. Now there are barriers to contentment. Uh, <clears throat> there's three words that I want you to remember that will, I, I can be assured will keep you from becoming content. The first is good old C, coveting. So <clears throat> the love of material things or money itself, I can assure you is a barrier to contentment. It will keep you from being uh, satisfied. The second one is another C, and that is controlling. Uh, the more controlling of a person I try to be, the controlling of my circumstances or trying to get things my way, the less likely I will be able to be content. Because the more controlling I try to be or I try to control the circumstances around me or getting things my way, is there's always those things that come into my life that I can't control, that are beyond me. 
and they're going to throw things off and create a frustration inside of me. And then the third one, I was trying to get three C's, but I didn't, couldn't come up with a, a, a good C word. Maybe if any of you are good in English, you can. But the third one is obviously anxiety. The higher my anxiety goes, the lower my contentment will be. And so those things will just be barriers. They'll keep me from experiencing the contentment that God wants to give to me as a gift through trusting in him. <clears throat> this is what contentment does for us. Contentment produces an adaptability. If you look at the next verse, Paul says, you know, in essence, I learned how to, uh, to have lots of money. I've learned how not to have any. I've learned how to be hungry and I've learned how uh, not to have plenty of food. So in other words, whatever his circumstance was, he learned how to be adaptable. And, uh, the ability, adaptability is the ability to change or be changed to fit the circumstances. Again, this is not, I guess I have no choice, Just it, that's just the way it is, and you gripe and complain. No, adaptability is the ability to adjust to disappointments. It's the ability to, uh, to adjust to changing circumstances that are beyond my control, but not to have my emotional state to come crashing down. True contentment that leads to adaptability comes from a growing dependency on God. A growing dependency that grows out of knowing who God is. A lot of people treat God as a good luck charm. Can I turn to, in your Bibles to 1 uh, Samuel Chapter 4, verse 3. Chapter 4. <clears throat> so you will notice that the, the Philistines, and there's always this constant battle uh, as you get uh, to the end of Judges and you go through First and Second Samuel. It seems like uh, the Israelites and the Philistines are always at each other. Well, the Philistines have arrived on the scene and they've attacked Israel and the result is Israel was defeated and they lost significant number of, of men. 4,000 of them, it says in verse two, uh, were killed on the battlefield. So when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Now, if they thought about it, they would know the true answer to that. Because the two, they, if you know how the book of, of Judges ends, it says, and the, there was no king and the people did what? What they thought was right in their own eyes. They did their own thing. They didn't pay attention to the Lord. And the two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, who were Eli's son, were totally disregarding the sacrifices, misusing them to get food. They were sleeping with women. And so there was a lot of disobedience and chaos that was going on in the nation of Israel at the time. So if they would have thought about that and repented, it would have been completely different. But notice what they do. They said, what? Well, let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with go well with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. And that's exactly what they did, but the end result was that the judgment that God had pronounced on, Lee, on Eli and his two sons as a result of their blatant disobedience and disregard for the holiness of God, by the way they treated the sacrifices, they were... Kill. The two sons were killed, and Eli, Eli who um, died. So they got the, they were defeated again. But I want you to understand that basically how they were looking at God was not 
as somebody whom they love and serve and they were desiring to be obedient to, but they were just seeing God as a good luck charm. Bring them into the camp and we'll win. It has nothing to do with how we live our life. And so if we kind of have that approach or view of God, there isn't really a true dependency and a willing to submit ourselves to God and understand that the circumstances that happen to us that are beyond our control, God is working in and through them and we surrender to what God is doing. Now, flip over to Romans chapter four, go to the New Testament. And I want you to see, Paul is explaining a little bit about Abraham's faith. So here Abraham is over 100 years old, his wife's 90, and God has said, you know what? I'm gonna make you a great nation. And not only that, you're gonna be a blessing to many nations. And Abraham's like, really? Problem is, we're well beyond the childbearing years. We have no child. But the Bible is very clear that Abraham trusted God and believed God. And in fact, because he believed God, he was, he's identified as being righteous because he banked on what God had promised him that God would fulfill it. He was counting on it. But what we do is get a glimpse into how Abraham understood and viewed God. As Paul explains uh, Abraham's faith. Go to verse 17 of chapter 4. It says, uh, uh, Paul is arguing that Abraham um, is the father of us all. Uh, that is all people of faith. He says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. That's what God has promised to Abraham. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. And notice what he says about this God. The God who gives life to the dead and call things that are not as though they were. In other words, that phrase could almost be, he brings into existence those things that don't even exist. You see, Abraham had a sense of the true greatness of God, his power, and that he was not limited. But he also had a sense that he needed to live in faith and reliance on that, and that that should shape the whole of his life. Not just grabbing, I, I need God now at this moment because I'm, I'm in a mess in my life. So God, be my good luck charm. He's not at all functioning like that. Instead, he's saying, no, God, I recognize you are the God who can bring to life the dead. You are a God who can actually bring something into existence out of nothing. And so, God, I believe that you, what you have promised, you will do. And that shaped his life. You see, true contentment grows out of that understanding that sense of experience of the greatness and the power and the holiness and the beauty and the grace of our God. And that we really allow those realities of who God is to sink into our soul so it so grips us so that we are sufficient within ourselves no matter what circumstances comes upon us. And it's not a self-sufficiency, it's because God is alive within our soul. And we're no longer dependent upon what is happening in our circumstances for a sense of inner peace. We live in a time of chaos. 
<clears throat> Remember I said last week, let's not waste COVID. So here is my challenge. Every one of you, you're sitting there, you're looking so charming, except with your mask on. Isn't that frustrating? I'm tired of wearing a mask. And I'm tired of you wearing a mask because I can't see your face and I'm having a hard time trying to put names and faces together. So be patient with me. But it is a season for us to sink deeper into our understanding and knowledge of God and experience Him at a deeper level. It is a season for us because we are in a circumstance that is beyond our control to learn contentment. A contentment that grows out of a realization that God is greater than all our circumstances and we can bank on him. A contentment that grows out of a complete reliance on God. As we journey forward, let this be a season for us to learn contentment. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. <laughs>
Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we go out today with that great assurance. By your hand, you lead us. Lord, help us through this week to hold on tightly so that we might be led of thee.